great. It is October the 12th, 2012, and um, uh, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, where you will find the largest compilation of independents and third-party candidates who are going to be on the ballot uh, this year for the House of Representatives, for Senate, for Congress, basically. Um, there's a presidential race going on right now, but uh, the, the, that might be kind of overshadowing uh, the congressional races. And uh, we have 51 interviews, and uh, we're suggesting an idea that you take a close look at them, and maybe the best protest vote would be to vote in as many independent third-party candidates as possible. That's a choice um, that has been waiting for people to select. Um, they're, they're always there, but they never get chosen. But uh, this might be the year when Congress has a 10 percent approval rating. And we have Adam Kokesh on the line. Um, and Adam, thank you for your time. He also has ran as a, uh, a, well, as a candidate in the Republican Party in 2010 in New Mexico. And, um, but you could say he was not your typical candidate, not your professional politician. So he does have some experience with that. And Adam, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to um, you know, help uh, bring these issues to light to the public so you know get the process of getting a fully informed and educated uh public there yeah well thanks i appreciate the opportunity great and and i'm sure most people have heard of adam uh adam kokesh um uh, k-o-k-e-s-h and uh so it is also um let's see it's adam versus the man uh adam versus the man dot com and that's it and also on the YouTube channel, you just write in Adam Kokesh or um, AVTM, and, and it'll come right up. And um, so, uh, interesting enough, um, I, I did actually, you know, decide to write down some questions here because we usually, in, you know, interview candidates, and I have a set list of questions. I usually try to ask them all the same type of questions, type of questions that they might not get in the debate. Even if they get in the debate, they give them the like the silly questions, and. Uh, you know, give the more impactful questions to the Republicans and the Democrats, um, although you can answer them in any way that you want. Um, but uh, running in New Mexico, um, you, you know, before uh, the same state as Gary Johnson is in, um, just t talking about political strategy, um, because I'm sure, you know, you, you probably um, have some strategic thoughts. And um, having this open conversation, I guess, you know, hopefully believing that, uh, you know, having an open strategy, kind of like open source software, um, you know, we don't have to hide and, and play three-dimensional yes. chess. What, yeah. what, do you, what do you think is, um, you know, if you were giving advice, if you're like the chairman of the Libertarian Party or, or something like that, like what would you suggest to, to actual candidates who are in position right now, sir? Well, I, I think... Sorry for calling I, you, sir. <laughs> well, I, I think first it's, we have to discuss what is the role of politics and, and actually separate that from the more important uh, objective of, of than more important than any political objective of achieving a voluntary or, or a free society. And politics is certainly an important part of that, but it's really only a limited part of that. And, you know, by no means do you, by virtue of having been born under the protection of one, you know, violent gang of thugs of government, have any particular obligation to participate in the political process or to vote or anything like that. So if we can just sort of get that out of the way, when we talk about engagement in the political process, I still think there's a huge value in it. But the majority of, you know, of, of politics is, a ref you know, in a way it's a reflection of the paradigm and politicians and governments will get away with what the paradigm allows them to get away with and so i, I don't think you'll you know, as long as the paradigm allows there to be a system as big and corrupt as it is in, in government that is, is is as destructive as it is and is as you know as much as it exercises arbitrary authority over people against their will you know is is proportionate to what the paradigm believes is acceptable, or what the people generally believe is acceptable. And remember, government is still just people. It's not like any special entity. There's nothing that makes them them different as people. But they, through uh, a system of the elections, give themselves an arbitrary power over the people that is, uh, you know, uh, unjustified. And then we, we see this all the time, and this is what we're, you know, but, but we have to acknowledge that the people are voting for this. That you know, even if Gary Johnson were to be allowed to debate, and I think that would be one of the most amazing things in the world, 
but not because you know he would convince people and that you know the country would turn in a month, but that it would make it turn that much faster by being exposed to the message. And it would be really interesting to see what would happen if Gary Johnson was able to debate. You know, if he would take you know who he would take a, a bigger chunk of votes from, and you know who he would be, you know, who he would be reaching with his message. And unfortunately, uh, and, and I think a lot of people who were turned on to philosophical libertarianism by Ron Paul, you know, are, are disappointed with Gary Johnson um, for, for not being, you know, uh, as philosophical as Ron Paul. But, you know, he does have some advantages as well. And his executive experience, I think, is a, is a huge plus that, uh, that Dr. Paul never had to his credibility. And I think being able to bring the message as, as Gary Johnson is is incredibly important. I'm mean, wholeheartedly support him, him doing that. Yeah, a lot of um, people like him, too. He's a likable character, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Look, fundamentally, the change is not going to come from the political process. The, you know, it, it, And I believe that when the paradigm shifts, it'll be reflected through the political process one way or another. And, you know, frankly, when it comes down to it, I don't really care. I mean, I, I, but, but my theory and my, my hope and prediction is that it's going to happen as, as a process of localism, you know, and, and relatively quickly, and that there is kind of uh, a point at which society hits a conscientious decision, and it's a tipping point that we're going to come to, where libertarianism is in the, is the message of the non-aggression principle, uh, universalized, of, of non-violence, which is what the message really is, of, of individual rights, uh, and of property rights as, as a mechanism of, uh, you know, deciding how you relate to other people, and how then you can see society being organized, but it's not about that. It's, of course, about respect for you as an individual human being. So, anyways, I think that we're going to come to that point, and, and what, my, what I'm hoping to see is that it, it is a process of localization, that at some point someone says, or, or there's, there's just a national consensus, hey, this federal government thing isn't feasible anymore. Is there any reason that, you know, we shouldn't just uh, abolish it and have uh, just go back to the state governments? And I, and I think there's actually a certain amount of pressure already building from that. You know, obviously the Free State Project, Free Staters in New Hampshire are, uh, you know, advocates of secession. And uh, they even joked once about having me run for governor of New Hampshire uh, on a secessionist platform. So that would certainly be interesting. They certainly know how to recruit an egomaniac like myself to join the Free State Project. But it's a wonderful group of people. The idea... Is, and, and everybody who's moved already to New Hampshire is technically an early mover. There are 13,000 people signed up, and the idea is that those who have committed will commit to move when there are 20,000 people. So it is it is still technically hasn't started yet, and already there's an incredible amount of liberty activism going on there. Right next door in Vermont, there's a big secessionist movement. Um, you know, when we talk about nullification, you know, maybe the federal government is nullified out of existence by the states. You know, by but you know, it's hard to see because. Well, with, you like, marijuana see, laws and, yes, and stuff exactly like that. exactly what I was talking oh, about. Yeah. You see it starting already with marijuana laws. Those are examples of nullification. It's just that they're not always talked about like this. We interviewed Jason Rink, who did the documentary Nullification, the Rightful Remedy, and Organized Nullification Tour on, on, the, uh, on AVTM Live yesterday. It was a great interview. And uh, that, that, you know, could be the way that it happens, but I really think that it, 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 and you have all of these noise like the drug war, um, you know, like uh, the NDAA, you have some states that have nullified NDAA, because it really is broadly offensive, you know, it's a great talking point, because a lot of people that aren't politically engaged uh, at least know that NDAA is a bad thing, and uh, most political acronyms go way over the average American said, you know, just, ah, that's, that's, there's a wrong with that in and of itself, that's just the, the fact of the, the matter of the level of political engagement right now, but you could also see that as a good thing. You know, that people are learning to ignore government. The problem is, you know, government is, is still growing and still being a threat. But I think it's also starting at the same time to fall away in chunks. And you have the big issue of monetary policy. Like, how does that one get through? Well, I, that's why I, kind of, I had a kind of a question on that or a thought here that, that you can expand on is that um, really people think some of these ideas are fanciful. But what seems to me is fanciful is... Um, Kind of like it's, what it's we're doing right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's like a gold standard. I, I mean, the, the gold standard compared to what, what we have now. Like, like what you're saying, like, we give credence to our elected officials the same way we kind of give credence and full faith and credit to the dollar. I mean, it wouldn't exist without that that accepting or that recognizing of it being of value. It's not like mm -hmm. gold. And we kind of need a gold standard for politics where there are real debates um, where, uh, you know, people can opt out. I mean, that's the liber libertarian principle is being able to opt out, you know, and, uh, and, and, and also kind of how can we... Um, you know, convince some of our, you know, green and, you know, progressive uh, allies in, in, in this time period that, um, do you think, we, I, I, I think you think that we kind of see them as allies, right? People occupy Wall Street people and um, people for causes that might be considered progressive? Well, in, in, in different ways, and, and I'm all for, you want to shake hands, you know, I mean, with people that, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't blame people for people in politics. You get a lot of this guilt by association crap, and I don't buy it, and I don't play that game. You know, I think if like if if John McCain came to me and said like actually came like actually John McCain personally came to me and said like Adam, you know, um, I'd like to reach out to you to do something for veterans, and in order to be involved, you know, you have to really promise that you're not going to talk about anything else, you know, and I know you'll get some PR benefit out of it, but you're not going to talk about anarcho-capitalism or volunteers or any other issues, but, uh, you know, we, we'd like to ask you to talk about something for veterans, you know, and I'd be like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, no problem, you know, um, and I'll turn around the next day on my podcast and tell everybody exactly what I think of John McCain, but, you know, I'm, I, I think we should be able to do that. That's a good and, way to do it, yeah. And, I, and, and really... This, this gets to the broader point of, you know, being humble about knowing that your perspective is your perspective and you can never speak for others. So to even collectivize people into these various categories, I feel like I have to say that as a caveat. You know, for the same way that volunteerism, libertarianism, cures racism. You know, because you stop seeing individuals as members of groups, you have to be careful about the same thing ideologically and realize that, well, you know, we as, as people who can embrace certain philosophies can say we're on the same page about this or that, ultimately, you know, you're, you're only speaking for yourself. And I think that's, that's very important to remember. But um, in, in terms of, like, allies, I think there, there's a lot of overlap, but this is one of the benefits of working outside of politics is that you don't have to go to progressives and say, hey, um, you need to agree with me on all of this and all of my philosophy, we can get them, you know, on our side in much more powerful, effective ways, because I think what you're getting at is that they're allies in the sense that they, that they just, they give a damn, you know, as opposed to the average American, and they can be engaged, and they are paying attention. If you can say, hey, you know, we really need to make an issue of the NDAA, and we want to nullify it in our state, you want to get with us with that? Cool, you know, or even convincing them, hey, you know your taxes are this. Here's hey, here's a way that you can evade paying taxes by using alternative currency, like by using gold or silver or Bitcoin or anything else. You know that those are things that that when you're not when you're not going to vote for my guy, you know you're just saying, look, look, this is a fact. This is a way you should live differently. This is something that's going to make the world better. I think those are people that we definitely should be considering as allies because they're active and they're caring and they're doing things. But you know that's that's. Uh, well, I think I in a sense we can appeal to the people too. Yeah, I think like because a lot of them like sustainable living, living on like farms, organic gardening. Like, imagine if um, the government opened up a lot of land so people could just you know you can't go out west anymore like the old days and and uh, just find a plot of land and build up a whole city. You, you know, I mean that's it. Did, it doesn't seem like that would be possible nowadays. Like, well, you know, it's funny you say it that way because in a way, in a different way, it's like totally true. I don't know if you know, Greece is selling off a couple of islands, and there are people on, on, in my audience have been joking about uh, buying one of them and starting a, a libertarian commune there, and basically you just you know, have that option. And there's a city, I forget where it was, somewhere in, somewhere in Latin America, um, Dominican Republic maybe, where they're... Uh, they, they're allowing, it, 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 it's, it's not all um, up and up in this case because it's, a, it's kind of a corporatized thing, but they're setting up uh, like economic freedom zones because they, they just, you know, they, they need to allow that to happen now. And it's just, you know, a sign of the times. But then you also have seasteading, 
which is a really exciting concept. The Sea Studying Institute that's exploring this, um, and Beatrice Friedman is the, the gentleman behind it, and he is, uh, I, I don't know where he is with the project, but what they're doing is promoting the idea of sea studying, which is going out in, 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 in a space on Earth that the government does not claim as their own, sea stead, and like homestead on the ocean, and set up basically with the same technology as a floating oil rig, you have a floating city. Well, maybe and, they'll, they'll be so, um, like, uh, you, you know, have so much liberty that they'll turn into Atlantis out there or something. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you never know. You never know. Really, the technology that's coming as fast as it seems these days, it's accelerating. Like, it is absolutely fucking accelerating. If you think it's getting fast now, it is, like, prepare to have your mind blown. Like, you gotta, you gotta, like... Yeah, we have a chance to beat the vicious cycle because we have, like, a category, a library on the Internet. Like, we didn't have that before. The last big library was, like, burnt, Alexandria, Library of Alexandria or whatever. There's probably one in the mm -hmm. Vatican. But, but nowadays, I mean, the, the way to beat a vicious cycle is to learn from the past. And, and now we can remember the past because it's all there. And so, I mean, and you, you talk a lot about evolution, and I, I've... So hear you on that. I think if I think of a future world, I would think of one that's libertarian, pretty much, mm -hmm. like a good society. And um, well, um, it, yeah. And, and when you get to that perspective, the benefit of ado of adopting that kind of historical perspective of seeing that we are simply evolving past statism, you kind of get to a Zen libertarianism, where you 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 really are free in your mind, and you realize that you you get to simply step back and, and watch this happen for everybody else. And you don't get, I mean, you can get angry, and I get angry, I'm very passionate, and I channel that, but like, I don't live angry. I'm not, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very calm person in my, in my normal life. I get stressed out about um, stuff for work, because, you know, right now we're doing some really exciting things with the, the business model here. And, like, just, oh, man, just today we're thinking about completely changing up our production. Well, I would like to hear about that. Yeah, I mean, any new projects? I remember one time you saying that you were going to go to Iran, and I was like, wow, that's risky, but <laughs> duh, that no, well, been, today, that's a great idea, though. I mean, you know how many people would be interested in watching that? I mean, well, you, that would be awesome. If someone can arrange that, we actually interviewed a guy today who went, and he was, his name was uh, Gary Etcheberry. And he was an amazing guest. He he just went as part of a tour group, and I, I don't know if, if he was allowed to really document as much. But I would, it's it's hard still to get a visa. I'd still be up for it if he could be arranged. But I was kind of well. Borat uh, went there, didn't he? <laughs> What's that? Borat. I think didn't Borat go there? It, it probably should be. The, it was, is that comedian guy? Um, Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I'd still like to go, but I'm really focused right now on getting my daily production up to speed and, and building the, the Anna vs. the Man machine, because it's, it's really coming together here. I've been doing, for the past few weeks now, uh, a live podcast from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and our listenership on the downloads and the, the radio distribution has been uh, at least about the same through our technical difficulties. But what we're looking to do is, is move it to the evenings now, and we've been just starting today was this week was supposed to be our first full week we missed one episode but we did three episodes and they were all kind of late the reason we missed an episode was a glitch on youtube and it was just youtube is a beautiful technology but it is and, and it makes sense that there would be a you know that niche would exist in the market for that technology and the people that have done youtube it's it's amazing but it, it is it has it is it is glitchy it is it is buggy and it, and and what's and, and I, I can understand if that was a part of the development, but what makes it at least twice as bad as it is just naturally from that or from whatever reason there is for the technical um, challenges, they just they just don't communicate. Like and you, the, you there's no there's no connection to YouTube. Like it is a black hole. We're we're part of a partner network now, Maker Studios, and it's a, it's a great position to be in. Uh, but we pay them. Well, you're yeah. growing, like, exponentially, it seems like. I mean, you, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we're on, a, we're on a good curve. We're on a good curve. So it, 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 that's why I'm stressing out. <laughs> you know, I'm like, uh, we're, we're toying with the formula here when, when we're getting into this new model. But the main thing is that we launched a 20-minute nightly newscast. 
and uh, that's the that's what I'm talking about. We did three of last week, and it's, it's like a whole new product. We've got a, a team of ten volunteer writers that's growing, and it's gonna it's as good as it is now. It's it's well, it's pretty inconsistent, obviously, but as good as it is now, it's about to get a lot better when we when we reconfigure this formula. I'm thinking the sooner we do it, the better. But uh, this well, is the first thing I got to make this weekend. For a website, Adam versus a man. I mean, you can't think of anything better than that. That sounds great, you know. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, but, because, uh, well, Adam. I, I mean, you, you know, it's a popular name, and um, I think uh, I think in Hebrew it just means man, right? So it's like man versus yep. a man, just one man, you know, and 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 all the supporters and and networks and stuff versus, you know, the powers that be. And um, well, it's not just the powers that be, because I really see the man as anybody that tries to exercise unjust authority, and, and in that sense, you know, we, we all have a little bit of the man in us. You know, every every human being is it is part of our nature uh, to to want to control our environment and to to do it ineffectively by trying to control human beings. Although the fact is, it works. It just doesn't work for everybody. And that way, all we're trying to do is improve the market of information and show people, hey, you know, you're you're better off when you're free. You're better off not following arbitrary authority and you know, marching people into showers. To oh shit, go to the Hitler argument, damn it. Um, yeah, but I, I, I anyways. Well, I just want to get your thoughts on two political, just strategic things, because of this year, when Ron Paul ran and they brought up those newsletters again, and I don't mean to rehash this, but I thought instead of being defensive about it, it would have been the perfect opportunity to get a big press meeting and use this to put it right back in their face and double down. And and, and, and also another thing, he should embrace Gary Johnson in the debates. I mean, because it makes you look bigger like that, that, that you, you know, they, they could have like tag teamed in the debates, yeah. you know, um, so... Uh, well, I, I agree, and, and in the case of uh, the, the newsletters, the, the response that really made the difference, I mean, I did a video that got 25,000 views, or wait, let me know, it was more than that, um, let, me, let me check on this one, but uh, the one that really got, uh, made an impact was Revolution Pack's video, uh, The Compassion of Dr. Paul. Um, I remember that with the patients, and yeah. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was the... Uh, the, the the black man from Texas who was testifying to how uh, to, to Ron's personal charity and uh, it was beautiful and it I, I don't know I think it got close to a million views online but um, it, it also got some some television airtime it got a lot of other airtime and, and really I think that was that was the response but it was still like it, that that only had the effect on the internet you know and, and for the, the voting public they were, you know, claiming to, to be trying to reach, there really needed to be a response from the campaign, even if it was just to say, hey, can we release this as an official campaign video? You know, that would have been enough. And and, and that would have made it a, a decent response. But you know what, there was, uh, yeah, Ron did kind of sort of try to brush over the issue, and I think he was protecting somebody, and I don't know who it was, I don't know. And, and I've, I don't want to throw any names around, because I've heard different names, and you could kind of, if you're really up on this issue, you could get in and you could figure out, you know, there's like, yeah, two or three people, really, that could have written the newsletters. And um, it, it's like too obvious, you know, for people to, to not be like, yeah, there's something fishy here and it's discrediting. And it's it, and it was it was handled in a way that, that made it really discrediting. And Ron, I, I, I really... And it was an opportunity too. He could have looked at it as an opportunity instead yes, of an attack. Yes, and he could have yes, and to preach how libertarianism cures racism. Yeah. Um, and he really could have. You're right. He really that was that was the other part of it. It was a missed opportunity. And the fact is, it made him it legitimately made him uncomfortable. And I liked what he said when Ron said it was an error of oversight. I fessed up to it, and that's it. Then then it's like okay, well then who the heck was it? You know, then someone someone ought to step up and 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 uh, you know, and I don't know. I have no idea really what went on behind the scenes there. I have some theories, um, and and I, you know, it's crazy, man, with this Jesse Benton thing. I've been like totally vindicated now. Oh yeah. You know, he went to work for Mitch McConnell. Really, like that's that's how you advance libertarianism. Sure, that's not yeah. You know, you're not going to start. You're just not going to convince anybody that uh, that you're 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 on 
the side of Liberty. <laughs> you know, yeah, Donald. not your stepping like, stone. I'm thinking of that song. You know? It's just, it's not. You know, you, you know, you're working for something else, and that it, everything they've done. You know, the people, the non-libertarians around Ron Paul, uh, all of them, everything they've done is just proven right. And it's, I, it's one of those things. Like I really hate being proven right, but I don't. You know, I, I really. I, well, that was an opportunity, too, because just because people have flaws doesn't mean they can't rise above it. I mean, I think the strongest way someone would look at it is to admit their flaws, and, and, you know, then it's quickly healed. Just like we want to quickly heal this economy, you know, it's better to quickly heal yourself as well, and uh, sometimes. Um, but I, I'm curious to know what you think about Noam Chomsky, because I think, didn't he use kind of like an anarcho-capitalist, like, description of himself, or like a, some kind of libertarian thing, or or anarcho-libertarianism? Do you... I, w I would be speaking beyond my expertise there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just curious. Um, well, Adam, um, any, the, like, you, you know, is, is anything on your radar, right, you know, in the next, uh, you, you know, before the end of this year? Um, well, I'm really focused right now on building my business even more than anything. I, I'm just having a great time. I think it's a really good time to be in independent media. I think it's a really incredible time. I think this is the real continuation of the movement beyond the Ron Paul phase. And, you know, no matter what your perspective is, there was a Ron Paul phase, you know, for, you want to say, the last eight years where the majority of people who, identif who would identify as any stripe of libertarian in this country would, you know, were focused on... Dr. Paul, and wonderfully so, and it was an incredible phenomenon that brought a lot of people in, but now there there isn't someone to carry the torch in that particular venue. Uh, Rand has made it clear that he's different, and that's not what he wants to do, and that's fine, and I think Rand's a great ally, but when it comes to, you know, when I say not one of us, when I can identify with people as voluntarists, he's not one of us, and that's fine, like, it doesn't make him a bad guy, although... There are other things that. Well, are there are 50. some voluntarists on my website, libertarianprogressive.com. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are a few out there, you know, and hopefully they can, you know, kind of carry that torch as well. But it's not just in that arena, I understand. I right. Understand. And, I, and I don't think that the opportunity of a candidate coming up with the Ron Paul presidency as the Constitution being a beautiful message and having a guy that has so much credibility on his own integrity and his own consistency and all of his votes. You know, that that, that, that opportunity, like, Ron Paul was 40 years in the making. Like, the, Ron, the 2008 campaign was 40 years in the making, you know what? And there, there is no one that is, that is 20 years into that right now. There is no one that is really even, I mean, Michael Benaric, you know, there is, you know, and you know, I don't think he's running for president again. There is really no one right now that is in a position to be that kind of confidence-inspiring phenomenon that Ron Paul was. And I think that, that I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. It just means that the focus of the movement is going to be different now. And it might be that, in a sense, Ron Paul played his role, and it was to bring over a certain people that he was going to reach through the venue of being a presidential candidate. And now it's up to us to reach everybody else through independent media. And I think that's the next, the, the, going to be the focus of the movement. Unless, I, I mean, someone could come along. Napolitano, I guess Napolitano would, would, would be uh, a candidate. Gary Johnson, you know, but Napolitano, you, he would be exciting. Again. Yeah, Napolitano would yeah. be exciting. Yeah, but would, would he inspire the same confidence that Ron Paul did? You know, could he do that? And, and I don't know. I'm not saying. But it was. I'm, I guarantee it was a lot easier for someone with Ron Paul's record than someone with Napolitano's record. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but, you know, holy crap. You know, hundreds of votes as a congressman with all the pressure to corrupt the congressman. You know, thousands of votes. You know, all constitutional. That... Yeah, that does not just happen overnight, and there is no one in, in that position. Now, that doesn't mean it can't happen, that someone could step up and be that inspiring figure. But even if it doesn't, what is going to happen is that people like you and me are going to keep making independent media, we're going to keep speaking out, we're going to keep producing innovative products, 
we're going to keep being empowered by this technology to do more and more. I mean, I'm sitting in my studio right now. People joke that it looks like a grow room had a love child with a spaceship. But, like, you know, we're able to, to take this, the, the, the basic technology that wasn't affordable to people, like, in our position just a few years ago, and now it really the sky's the limit to see what you can do on, on, a, on a budget if you can get organized or, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I haven't been doing anything other than this, but like if I had been, you know, I mean, you could work a smug job for, for a couple of years now, and this is one of the beautiful things about just the advancement of, of human progress and, you know, uh, technological capacity and our, our productive capacity. And I've, I've often said that, you know, things are going to radically change and the welfare state will be irrelevant when the average American can work for one year and with the money that they make in one year support a, a family for, you know, their entire lives at the same standard of living that we enjoy today. Like, how is that going to radically change things? You know, because we're coming to that point. Like, all, human productivity is on an exponential growth curve following technology. So, that's that's really exciting, but just already, you know, little paradigms today. will make that happen. I mean, just, you know, starting with ending the war on drugs, getting different candidates for yeah. choices. I get, you know, just bring, telling truths to power where it's it's you know they can't argue with that that reason. Refining the argument uh, and letting truth win. Um, and uh, I want my point. Is I want the competition in the market. I want everybody listening who's got a vision, who's got what it takes to you know. Just like you got to work for a couple of years and save up some money, or you got to you got to you got to get a couple loans, or you got to just you know sell some sell a couple of guns in your collection, or whatever it is. You got to get a microphone and a camera. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive to be functional, to be something that's worth your time that you can start building into something, and then start turning those hobbies into full time jobs, and then start building an audience. And if you don't want to do that, or you want to focus on something else, or you're working towards something like that, but you know, if you if you care about this. Be engaged with an audience. Help build an audience. You know, find something that's a tool for outreach that you enjoy, that makes your life better. And I would hope that you know what I, what I do with Adam versus the man is something that provides that value to people. Oh yeah, it's definitely fun. A, lot, a good place for people to get together. A lot of interesting debate going on. And um, and also just to clarify, like I don't mean like electing these independent and third party candidates as like you know leaders, even though I consider them somewhat a leader because they're putting themselves in the position. But I mean like kind of like um, you being the leader and, and propelling them there and um, as either a demonstration vote or, or whatever, but I mean it's really your voice behind that and in a sense you're just kind of using them as a vessel or a tool to get across, you, you know, f freedom issues. And mm -hmm. uh, Well, Adam, um, it's been a pleasure and uh, you, you know, uh, I, much continued success for you, I hope, and uh, uh, so thanks for your time today. And I uh, appreciate it, sir. And is any closing thoughts that you want to share with every anyone? Adam versus the man dot com. You can email me at Adam at Adam versus the man dot com. Sounds good. Uh, thank you again, and have a nice weekend. Thanks. Thanks. Peace.